Okay. Now we can talk. All right, this is episode six of Car Policy, and this is about the Mint origin story. That's what we're starting with. So back in 2009, I had just, everything in my life had completely fallen apart. I was uh, in a band. I'd been playing in a band for six years. I'd recorded music. I was supposed to be going on tour. The tour got, uh, kind of the rug got pulled out from underneath me. Really cool story. Tell that one another time, but um, very sad for me. And so I had to leave Los Angeles because I was completely broke. And I decided to move up to Vancouver, Canada, where my grandmother lives, or rather lived, and I moved in with her. I was totally broke. My parents were living in Germany, and so I moved in with my 92-year-old grandmother, and my sister was living in downtown Vancouver, so I had that kind of connection. Yeah, I was in grade 10 at the time. <laughs> Colin, where, where were you at? Where, where, where what year is this? Yeah, 2009. 2009. Uh, I was getting drunk at University of Delaware, oh, not wow. studying. Okay, Not cool. studying at all. Excellent. Cool. We were in very different places. It's amazing how <laughs> yeah. uh, the universe eventually brought us together and we're sitting on this couch right now because yeah. those are very different circumstances. Yeah, I think I was in Susical the Musical. Yeah. But anyway, Susical the musical. continue your story. Yeah. And uh, I was ordering Sam's Red Bull Vodkas at Klondike Kate's. Very cool. And Sam has a very rich history in musical theory. Absolutely. Theater. But you're uh, living with your grandma. Continue. <laughs> living with my grandmother. And... Um, I don't know how it happened. It was one day I was sitting at her like just ridiculous. I mean, this computer was like from the ni- early 1990s. And and I came across a picture of the Bash Brothers. It was a picture of Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco. And I was sitting there and I had nothing going on in life. I was applying to business schools, but I had been like my, my test scores were just not where they should be. And so I had applied to schools and I got a uh, rejection from the school I wanted to go to. Uh, I applied to Cambridge, got rejected. And so I was kind of licking my wounds. And I saw this picture of the Bash Brothers and it just jarred this memory in my head of like a really happy time when I was a kid. And I saw Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco. And so I, I, I Googled like baseball cards, Jose Canseco. And like, as soon as I saw, I saw a few pictures of of like 89 tops, 88 tops, 89 upper deck. It was just like, it, it was like this lightning hit my my soul. It was like I wanted to. All of a sudden, I was like, "Wait, what about those Mark McGuire cards?" And I started googling them, and I saw eighty nine, you know, Mark McGuire and eighty eight and eighty seven, and it was just like I don't think I went to bed until like three o'clock in the morning. I started like googling all these players I liked and seeing their cards because I had collected when I was a kid, and then I stopped collecting when I was about thirteen, maybe fourteen. And uh, moved to Germany and didn't wasn't around cards or whatever. And so this time in 2009, when I was what just turned 30 years old, it was my first time even seeing these pictures again. These these cards. Yeah, and like, was it just the fact that oh, card collecting is still around? Was it like oh, I want to see what my cards are worth? Nothing like, what, about that. Well, what what kind of like what what was really making you so excited? It was every time I saw a picture of a card, I remembered. Mm-hmm. Um. It just filled my my soul with good, warm feelings. Mm. It was like this dopamine release. It's hard to describe. I just felt like it just made me feel kind of warm and cozy. I remember like just seeing, you know, like then I remembered, I was like, who are those other guys? And I was like, oh, yeah, Don Mattingly. And there was Cal Ripken. And it was like it opened up this part of my brain that I hadn't thought about since I was a kid. It was like the most pure, it was like somebody injected pure nostalgia right into my heart and, and it just filled me with good feelings. And and that was it for the next, I think week, all I did was like, I'd go on Google and downloaded all these pictures, you know, all the, these different cards, almost like I was building a digital collection. And then I started learning about them and I, and I figured that everything would be super expensive. I was like, okay, a Ken Griffey Jr. card is going to be like tens of thousands of dollars for his rookie card. And I was shocked when I discovered that these cards were actually still cheap, like really cheap, um, like actually cheaper than when I had them at the age of 13, that I knew I could buy Conseco card for like 50 cents as opposed to maybe $2 from when I was a kid. And so it was just all these like warm, happy feelings. And it kind of got me through that next month or two. And I ended up uh, working on the GMAT, ended up studying, uh, took it again, tried to call Cambridge. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to tell them that uh, 
that they actually should take me. Here's all these good reasons. And I called up the, uh, the admissions office and I said, Hey, listen, I know you guys rejected me. You put me on this wait list, but I think I'm going to, I'm the right fit for the school. And I'm going to bring all these special, you know, these, uh, differences that you're not going to get from a lot of the other people there. And the guy on the phone picked up, uh, and was like, Oh yeah, your name's Brian, right? Um, yeah, you're actually on a list that we want to invite out to, uh, Cambridge to come and interview. And so, uh, I ended up going out there interviewing, getting in, but it was like this, the, there was this time of great sadness during kind of January, February, March of 2009, where my life felt like it had fallen apart. And it was these baseball cards that I was looking at at the time while I was studying for the GMAT and prepping to, you know, do this interview in Cambridge. And so it was like this, this kind of thing that made me feel happy and gave me a purpose. All of a sudden I had no purpose at all. And I, all of a sudden I started building these collections of cards and I had this spreadsheet and I was putting the pictures in and, you know, and then I'd go and, you know, make dinner for my grandmother or I'd meet, meet my sister in downtown Vancouver. We'd have like a, a, you know, fun walk around Stanley Park on a weekend or something. But I remember being on, on the bus into Vancouver one day to see my sister and I was like, you know what, I want to build a frame for a wall where I can put all my favorite cards up on the wall and be able to see them. Like if I have an office in the future, I want to be able to see all my cards on a frame on the wall. And I started designing this, this frame and I'll, I'll have Sam post a picture of it right here uh, for those who are watching this on, on YouTube. But like I put this frame together of all my favorite cards that I could remember at that time. And I think it was like a five by seven or something like that. And I put them all in this little order of when the players had come out and organized also by kind of year and set. And I spent way too much time kind of making this thing. I called it the, my baseball card frame. And I would look at it. And just by looking at it, like I'm flying across the ocean to Cambridge to go interview. And I'm here I am on the plane looking at my frame and saying, well, do I want to switch the two Mark Grace cards? It was like this weird kind of design thing. I was really into the whole concept of how it would all fit together, the design, the order of it. And I was like, I'm dead set on this. As soon as I can, I'm going to build a frame for this thing and I'm going to stick it on my wall. And if I have some office and I'm working at Apple or, you know, one of these companies in the future, I'll have this really cool baseball card frame and uh, in my office. And then anybody who comes in uh, that remembers these things, it'll be a fun talking point. And I thought it would be a good way to kind of meet other like-minded people. That's how I saw it back mm. then. And then when, you know, I got in, when I was at Cambridge and finally, you know, left grandma's house, moved to England and moved in, I started ordering. It was the first time I actually started really buying cards and had them ordered and shipped out to the university. And I'd be in my dorm room opening packs and putting together this frame. But, you know, it was the kind of thing where I was like, okay, to do the frame properly, you, I don't want to wreck the cards by gluing them or taping them. Of course. It, it has to be somehow in a case of its own and then stuck onto the wall. And I looked at one touches, but I didn't like the look of one touches or top loaders. They were always off center. Like um, one touches, there's more at the top than there's at the bottom. I wanted it to be kind of uniform. So I put a lot of, I've always loved design. I always love thinking about design. When I see badly designed homes or badly designed cars or anything, I'm always looking at things from a design perspective on how to improve it. And so with this frame that I had in my head, I was like, you're going to have to have a holder for it. And then you're going to have to have a walled thing. And I would, I would like a whole wall display. And I would go and Google, uh, every year I would Google, like, is there somebody making some sort of a, a wall display or a frame that I could put my cards into where my cards would be safe, but look cool. And I never saw any. They were always just trash displays. Sure. Were you were you going into card shops at all or in asking people about it? Yeah, I would go into card shops. I'd ask people about it. I started going into Hobby Lobby, going to Michael's, uh, all the different kind of like hobby kind of shops of other hobbies and trying to figure out how to do this. In fact, uh, a girl that I was dating in 2000, like like 15 or so wanted to, I, w I would talk about my frame to her and she was like, I want to, you know, she's like for your birthday, I want to go and actually get you this frame. And she goes, I went and talked to a frame shop and, you know, and they said, but they're going to have to destroy all your cards in order to put it into the frame that, and I said, yeah, I'd rather not destroy them. Uh, but super awesome. And thank you for, you know, doing that. That was a really nice gesture, but I want to make something better. And I think there's a, if I wait another year or two, somebody's going to build something that is going to be worthy of the cards I want to put on the wall. And as these years went by, uh, the cards that I had in that initial frame, I started taking them out as I learned more about the hobby. And I was like, well, actually, I want to have this card put in. And so the some of the values on some of the cards started increasing 
Um, and, you know, I wanted to have a Nolan Ryan rookie in there. I didn't have that in my first iteration of the frame. I wanted to have a George Brett rookie and I wanted to have a Mike Schmidt rookie. And so I started learning more about the cards and I, I really focused on Hall of Fame players kind of between like 1968 and 1993 uh, to build my frame. And so nobody ever really solved this problem until pandemic came and the three of us, you know, all of a sudden I had some more disposable income at the time. And I, so I started buying more cards. And so I didn't buy cards because of mint beginning. I was actually buying some because I wanted to open some packs and just kind of, yeah, you didn't tell us about it at all. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody you were, you about were opening it. packs and we had no idea. Yeah. Like I didn't really tell anybody about it. I mean, my sister knew about it. Uh, my parents, you know, if I was dating a girl for like a year, I'd finally be like, yeah, I collect cards. You know, it was something I really, really hid. Yeah. Why did you hide that again? I hid it because I felt a, a sense of a weird sense of shame. It's hard to describe, but like yeah. when I was up in Canada, you know, looking at those cards when I was 30 years old and I was like, you know, a grown man, 30 years old, looking at baseball cards from his childhood, I felt there was this sense of kind of a, a shame about it. It's hard to describe. I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people that experience that. Maybe they collect action figures or comic books or coins or well, there's no, there was no uh, online communities for you to be feel feel like you were part of a, a, a like minded group that felt like it was cool to do that. You had no um, affirmation from yeah, an like, outside, you know, validation that this is cool. Mm -hmm. Even though there were people everywhere doing it, mm -hmm. there was no way to know. Yeah, but, I had no idea. Like I'd walk into card shops in Vancouver. All the card shops I first went to were in Vancouver, yeah. Canada. And they were always kind of like trashy little dodgy shops with like blacked out windows. It, it, so I think part of it is going into those shops made it feel kind of, you know, tacky or sleazy almost where you'd go in and there'd be some one guy behind his desk. There'd be all these, you know, uh, dusty kind of counters and, and, sure. and cards, yeah. you know, those two shops actually act, yeah. both went out of business yeah. and, but there was something that felt weird about it. And I didn't know why, but I still felt compelled to want to put my collection together. Mm -hmm. And when I'd see all these dusty things and cardboard and plastic, I was like, man, this hobby like that I enjoy deserves something better. And I did find one. There was one guy that I followed that I found. It was Baseball Card Blog. I don't know if any of you that are listening to this ever read the Baseball Card Blog, but I started reading it in 2009. And the person that wrote that, and I can't remember who did, but that person I really resonated with. That person, it felt like they were speaking to me. That was like, I guess, the first influencer I followed. And I learned a lot of my baseball card knowledge was from the baseball card blog. Um, I don't think it exists. No, it doesn't exist anymore. I think he stopped, stopped writing it like eight or so years ago. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted there to be a better way than these dusty, dingy kind of smell, you know, smell like smoke kind of card shops and turned it into something much nicer. For and, sure. But uh, I'm curious, when was the moment that you're like, oh, everyone's doing this? This isn't like a, this, sh this should not be a shameful hobby. Like, um, like yeah. oh crap, millions of people collect cards. Yeah, I still, I never really Googled or looked up. And then, in, in fact, I never bought any modern cards. I only bought the vintage stuff. Yeah. I only bought things that were from either my era, like the you know 80s, early 90s, or stuff from the 70s, 60s, 50s, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really look at any of the modern things. Um, something felt just weird about buying new boxes. I, I just didn't get into the whole style of new kind of packaging. I, you know, there's too many variations, Bowman Chrome, Topps Chrome, you know, Dynasty and top, you know, just, there was just so many different, uh, th different modern stuff that it, it, I found it to be completely overwhelming. And so I didn't get any into any kind of community thing at all, other than baseball card blog until it was 2000, um, what was that? Early 2021? Yep. Early 2021. It, actually, it was my very first uh, TikTok post. Uh, so so this is what happens. Fast forward. That's when I finally when got over it. Yeah, that's when I got over the shame and realized, whoa, there's a lot of people out there. Interesting. Like up until then, I didn't know really anything about it because I had my own version of collecting and it was just very solo, very solitary. And yeah, I'd talk about it with a few friends. There were two Americans in Cambridge that I would talk about cards with. And uh, I gave them some cards while I was in school. And like I gave a Jose Canseco rookie card to one of my professors who had given me a gift. And I gave an 89 Upper Deck Griffey to a buddy of mine who helped me with some legal work at Cambridge. Um, 
but it was during the pandemic, Colin, Sam and I were working on our health and wellness company. I was buying these baseball cards and I, and we were starting to transition into do, maybe doing this veterinarian business. And I think I might've shown you guys a few of the cards that they were sitting on my desk as opening packs or whatever, but maybe, yeah. it was really when the topic of what are we doing next? And Colin come, you know, that day sitting on the couch at Colin's place. And he was like, uh, Brian, surely there's, let's take five minutes to look at other options. Do you remember that moment? So we were, we, we felt like we were, uh, we had this obligation to just, to just keep working. You know, we were, uh, working on a business that was, that was, um, uh, dependent on the, on the, uh, uh, pandemic more or less, right. We were, we were providing a service to help, um, with COVID testing and we knew that wasn't forever. And so we, uh, pivoted towards, okay, leveraging the current, uh, platform we developed and using it for a veterinarian business. And we'd done all the research, but the, just one, I remember one day we woke up and I was just like, wait a second. I had this, uh, aha moment. I'm like, wait, we, we don't really, I don't think any of us really want to be doing this. I don't think this is not as much as like we thought we did on yeah, day one. This doesn't really line. Like let's put ourselves uh, in, in our own shoes five years ago. And if we had could only look into the future and know that we had these resources and flexibility, would we be doing this or would we pick and choose? And, yeah. and that that's when I introduced this exercise of let's take an hour uh, we we had just started kind of talking about the to dos of the day, and I was just like, ah, oh, I don't really want to be doing this in my in my own head. And I'm like, surely there's there's got to be something better. So I, I I posed a question to the group. I said, how would you guys feel if we took an hour, uh, the next hour to just kind of reflect uh, in solitude on on the things that we love, the things that get us up in the morning, and and then see if any of those things could be possibly used in a, in, in some kind of business. Could we attach a business to any of these things? See if there's any, um, any crossover among us and let's, let's do this exercise. So we took an hour, we, we all took out a piece of paper. We wrote some stuff down, came back an hour later and we each had a, a really cool list of about 10 things, uh, across all different disciplines and genres and hobbies and interests. I mean, you name it. Uh, things that get us up in the morning. Uh, and there's a lot of crossover here, obviously. But the one thing that stuck out to us the most that we thought, wow, there could re probably really be a business there more than the other things and or, or more quickly than the other things was Brian's um, line item, which was better protections and displays and preservation for trading cards. And then that just sparked a whole... Uh, day of just research, and that's when we realized there was a there was a hole here in the industry. There was a void waiting to be filled. Yeah, how did you feel when you uh, when I first told you about the idea, Sam? Me? Oh man! Well, like uh, just going back to what Colin was saying was when you presented the idea, it was kind of like a what? What do you mean? There's no high end protections and dis displays for cards that are worth thousands, millions of dollars. And so it was kind of, I, I didn't necessarily believe you at first. I was like, there's no way. And then yeah. like Colin said, we did our research, came back to you and we're like, there is literally no one doing this. And that idea turned into the most, I, I've never been that excited in my life actually. Cause I just saw this huge opportunity where our, we could change our lives and we can change a whole industry. And that was just, uh, I'm just, I keep on saying exciting, but it was just so exciting that we, we were kind of on the the brink of something revolutionary. And to be part of that in the, at, the, at the early stages was pretty cool. So, yeah, um, I always liked the idea of doing things that nobody's ever done, or if it, somebody has done something before, I want to do something that's just an order of magnitude better, like a whole paradigm shift. And so I thought if I'm going to do this thing about cards and displays, then we got to go all the way with this thing. And so I, that very first day, I sketched up a design of what I thought a case for a trading card in its kind of perfected form would be. And the first thing that was non-negotiable for me is it had to be made out of glass. And so my first image of it was two pieces of glass coming together with a, a thin piece of metal around the edges to kind of hold it together. 
And there were diamonds in there, too. And I put diamonds <laughs> in there, man. I put little tiny diamond chips, and I had, instead of the grade with some flip at the top, I had everything kind of see-through, but with the grade kind of on the bottom, but very minimalist. It was like... It was engraved in, essentially. It was engraved glass. into the glass. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, this is what I want. I want something heavy. I want it to feel heavy in my hand so that it bears the weight of the value of both nostalgia or value as far financially that I assign to it or that it's assigned by kind of the whole of the market. market. And so I drafted this up and kind of sat on it for a couple of days. I even designed the packaging. Mm -hmm. I think the packaging was the very next thing of like, yep. yeah, we okay. Worked on the packaging. And as soon as I kind of saw those things and I, I couldn't help myself, I had to put these things together and I built a spreadsheet um, or like a whole prep PowerPoint presentation kind of thing, keynote uh, presentation of all the different kind of images. And I started, I was having so much fun with it that I started putting in different cards that I like into my own little case I had designed on this, you know, keynoted file. And I was just having a blast with it. And I got super excited and I was like, whoa, if I'm excited about this, there's got to be at least enough collectors out there that would like to have better designed cases and displays um, to, to justify this being a business. And I would see things like show your slabs. I would see, um, you know, PSA cases, SGC, Beckett, all well, the other the, the, cases. the bar has been so low, though. I mean, no one has ever had ever th considered display or cases until Ultra Pro. And once that became ubiquitous across the industry, no one no one thought to innovate beyond. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the the graders were never thinking about cases. You're, the graders are selling one thing and one thing only, and that's that's a grade. Um, the, the cases ha had never been, uh, they, they probably thought about it. It's it was like always this, an afterthought. Always, always an afterthought. It was the simplest solution you could have possibly have imagined for p protecting a card. And then mm -hmm. it stopped and yeah. then there was no innovation beyond. But yeah, the whole, the whole idea of protecting a card, it was just, it wasn't even just that it was just plastic. Like these cases aren't UV protected. All these things that as you do your research and you kind of like go into it more you're like wait a minute this is actually not just a ta it's a huge problem yeah these assets are degrading inside well yeah well, i think they yeah. do they fix the off off gassing issues with with uh with graded cases i think I psa know. may no. have addressed it i don't think I so don't think but so, like no. there's off gassing there's uv protection there's there's rattling there's ca counterfeiting there's yeah. all these things yeah, i mean i mean but but it's so funny when you look at it because all of those things that that have happened as a result of these poor crappy cases uh came when there wasn't as much attention on the these these the kind of like the value that mm -hmm. um the cards have now you True. know in retrospect it's like i guess that's that's all they could should have done they didn't know that the industry would become well the, what, there what were people can. back in the early 90s though i remember as a kid you could buy these like giant bricks of plexiglass and screw them and together they had screws yeah. and oh, people yeah. would build their own kind of you know these displays because people did want to display them they did want to perfect per, protect them the the irony there is that the screw in plastic actually ruined the cards. It's like the, no, the no one really looked at it. it as scientifically as as they do fine art nowadays. Yeah, or have yeah. been for. Decades. It was for always sure. an afterthought. People always wanted something better. I did. Everybody else did. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. What, what's the name of the company that um actually takes out? baseball cards out of the graded slabs because they know that that is bad for them. The Hall oh, of Fame. Yeah, the Hall Baseball of Hall of Fame. Baseball Hall of Fame takes them out of the, those graded yeah, cases. Yeah, we read an article that said they if somebody gives them graded cases, they open them up because they don't know how the polymers, the plastic, interact with the cards mm -hmm. over a period of time, which well, is that, a huge problem. And that's that's to my earlier point about museums having a, a higher yes. standard of care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think a lot Even of it has been, you know, most industries that are ripe for innovation, uh, people just get used to this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. Whether it's the taxi industry, everyone is like, oh, this is how it's done. It. And then Uber shows up and, you know, decimates the the taxis or like BlackBerry. I remember being um, I was working at Disney back in 2007 and everyone was obsessed with their Crackberries, you know, their black Blackberries. They had to have the QWERTY keyboard mm -hmm. and. And everyone at Disney was like, this is the way, this is the only way we'll do it. And I walked in in 2007 with an iPhone, one, because I've always been an early adopter in anything uh, technology. And I, I remember walking in and showing everyone an iPhone. And people were like, yeah, but there's no QWERTY keyboard. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, it's called multi-touch. You do it like this. Mm-hmm. You can type like this. And they're like, no, no, that, that'll never, you know, I'm, I'm happy with my QWERTY Yeah, keyboard. they're comfortable with it. They're right? super comfortable. Yeah. I think people get so used to comfort on things that they just, you know, take for granted. And so I think with like a lot of the cases in the hobby, like PSA and Beckett and so on, and all the other like 40 other graders that popped up, you know, during the pandemic time they can't be all around still <laughs> no i don't yeah. think so yeah. i've heard of a few that have definitely disappeared but it was just kind of like well i guess this is what we've always done you know the very first psa cases look pretty close to the ones that are currently out right now there's not that much of a difference i mean there's a little bit of extra protection the plastic's a little bit better but overall it's not that large of a departure you know if you put a 1991 psa case next to a 2024 case they're pretty close I mean, it's not a, it's not an order of magnitude change, right? And so I think people just got really comfortable in accepting subpar protections and displays. I think that's what happened. And so I think when the three of us were talking about it and we dug in deep, I think the thing that really changed everything, you know, so we, you know, when we were looking at this, we thought there's got to be a better way. And I had my designs, but I'm like, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a professional designer. I'm not an engineer. And it was like, we need to hire one. We need to bring someone in to see if there is a better way to do this. And we won the absolute lottery. You found him so quickly. I found him that day. I was, uh, I just Insane. went on um, Upwork. Jeez. <laughs> I went on Upwork. Who would have thought a two minute click on Upwork would change my life? Not a sponsor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not a sponsor. And uh, I found this guy, Xavier, in San Francisco. And he and I just immediately bonded over this project. Because he's a card collector as well. Yeah, he collects cards. But it was just we had similar backgrounds. He grew up in Germany on a military base. So did I. And we were there even at the same time. And we got to talking. And he goes, I think I know what you guys want with this. And so he came back like maybe a week or two later with initial sketches. And I remember when the three of us saw it, it blew our minds. Do you remember that? Of course. I think we were like driving across uh, to to Arizona. Oh yeah, because okay, wow. we were at a, wow. we were at a gas uh, a gas station stop in the middle of Arizona you know on our way to yeah, yeah to, to Phoenix because we were looking at maybe opening a calzone. Uh, uh, that's when it was shop. Man. That's when we were at the fork in the road after the success of the wellness company, and we weren't sure whether to go left or right. Yeah, left being this company or right being. Uh, DP Doe franchise owners. I mean, DP Doe. That's a, what's that's DP a, Doe? Oh man, I love DP what's, Doe. What's DP Doe? Remind remind everyone the good people out there what DP Doe is <laughs> if they don't know what it is. I'm from the West Coast. I didn't grow up with it. You guys. Okay, so Coast, so uh, I went. I did my undergrad at Cornell in Ithaca, New York, and there was a calzone shop right in town and called in College Town. It's generous to call it a calzone shop. It's really, uh, <laughs> uh, really like p- low quality dough stuffed with all kinds of crap in in the vague form of a calzone Man, it was so good i loved it so much it, it, it's 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 yeah i survived my last year of, of college there are really my last two years of college in ithaca i survived on DPO. It, it should say you know required you know eight beers deep before enjoying <laughs> yeah one it of should these have certain health because, warnings or something because it's, no sober person would awful. ever enjoy sorry dp dough well, i was a sober person and i ate so much dp dough you were the exception <laughs> to the rule yeah and so we we traveled to arizona because we were thinking about um either opening our own or buying a DB dough. Yeah, we were looking at uh, franchising some DB doughs because I wanted to take the money that we had made because I'd spent so much of my life being so risky and taking all these chances. And I wanted to have a sustainable cash flow that would just be like a minimum guaranteed guaranteed income. And so I thought, well, let's take all this cash from um, the health and wellness company and put it into something like a franchise or something that will just kick off a monthly check to then go and do other things. But I didn't ever want to be on the edges of poverty ever again, because I'd been there several times. What I didn't know is I was going to be there twice more after this. Yep. But so DP Doe kind of came and went, but on that trip across Arizona, we got the first document. I think that was when it happened. We got a document from Xavier and it blew our minds. The first thing that blew my mind about it is that he he took all the information that had previously been on the flips and moved it to the side in a laser etch on a on a steel bezel. It was like this game changer. Super simple change, but instead of having like all the information up top, laser etching it all on the side. 
And this has been an, wow. a wow a thing that has been kind of up for debate for people in terms of what what they're wanting to change with current slabs. Even before that came came about, people were like, "What if we put the flip on the bottom?" Yeah, and that was like a revolutionary idea. Yeah. You know, people were we were trying to think of a solution to yeah to because bring people more hate focus the flips and they want to bring more focus and attention to the card itself. Yeah, why do you want a card that has a card catalog? kind of Dewey Decimal System thing on the top that completely distracts from, not only distracts from the card, but it's totally asymmetric. Mm -hmm. And so you, it's kind of lopsided. It's and also like a third of the size of the card. It is. Yeah, it's, it's ludicrous. And I remember Xavier, when he was first talking about it, he goes, you did this thing called the squint test as a mm -hmm. designer. And he goes, if you squint, you're looking at a card, your eyes are drawn up to that flip up to the top. Smart. And he goes, it shouldn't be that way. He yeah. goes, eliminate the flip put it on the side in a laser etch. Blew our minds. Blew our minds. I and remember <laughs> Brian screaming at the, <laughs> at the ga at gas station, he gets it. <laughs> he, gets he, it. Gets it. <laughs> he gets it. He gets it. He gets it. He gets it. When I say that somebody gets it, they get it. That's probably one of the biggest like badges of honor that I can give oh, to somebody. Oh, yeah. I care about that more than yes. almost anything else. Gets it. If somebody yes. gets it, He's on the same page. Totally on the same page. Yeah, no, we were yeah. really stoked about it. Really happy about it. And yeah. and even his first initial drawings are pretty much exactly what we have today with Mint. Pretty there's, close. I mean, there's pretty, a variation. Pretty close. The one problem that Xavier had, though, is that he is not a mechanical engineer. Shame on him. I know. How dare he only be an amazing industrial designer? Son of a gun. No, he's so talented. Xavier is beyond talented. And I'm a really so nice grateful. guy. And yeah, <laughs> great guy. I love this guy. It's fun hanging out with him. And so I asked him after we went through a lot of iterations of packaging and for some reason we thought packaging was really important back then. It, it, that, that's true. And sorry, just one thing I wanted to touch on yeah. just to toot Xavier's <laughs> horn some more, not just, not just from a design element, just from a looks perspective, but he was pitching so many really cool technologies to you too at a very mm -hmm. early stage. Yeah. St some that will obviously integrate in, in, in the future. Some that will be in mint case like, 2.0. So like, this guy's a... He's a smart kid. Yeah. No, Xavier already kind of designed the G2, the G3 cases. Yeah, he killed it. And so, yeah, he deserves to have his horn tooted. And he's actually a, an equity holder now in the company, which is really cool. Really, really I cool. remember why we we focused on on, on um, packaging is because at the time, the the whole unba unboxing uh, mm. fad was really popular across YouTube, to, uh, TikTok, et cetera. And we, the only comparison we had was the only standard was cardboard boxes and and um bubble bu uh, bubble wrap yeah uh for cards coming back from let's say APSA or or whatever so given that was the the bar it was it could only go up from there that's yeah. when we we're like hey what's let's turn the 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 receipt re the receiving of the shipment as an uh, an experience in and of itself what now what does that then we looked towards apple now we all know that whenever you receive something from Apple, the unboxing is is luxurious. So, what kind of what, what aspects of that can we integrate into this? Well, yeah. you know, and that's true. And but it was also one other big piece, which was I thought it wasn't going to take that long to manufacture. That's what these I was going to say. We yeah. thought we were going to come in <laughs> so quick into the market. Yeah, I was and like, how hard can putting two pieces of glass and a steel uh, chassis around it? How hard can that well, be? Well, that, that's mm -hmm. not hard. What we didn't realize is that. That wasn't what the product ended up being. Yeah, Very it true. ended up being uh, a lot more. You know, fifteen or so more pieces. Yeah, because like you said, uh, Xavier wasn't a mechanical engineer, and so he he found you a prototyping a company, right? Yeah, and then through his designs, sent the designs over, sent you a prototype, and it was just falling apart. Yeah, it was actually it was. Yeah, so the, after Xavier, we had made a, a choice on the design of the one that I wanted to build. I uh, said, Xavier, let's go and do this. He goes, okay, I got a prototyping lab. We'll take it too. So he took it there and he did. He made, uh, he brought in piece of steel, two pieces of glass and uh, gave him a card. Gold inlay. Oh yeah. He put a really nice gold inlay. We thought the gold inlay looked really cool on the design uh, pictures. And so then I went up to San Francisco when it was delivered. And I remember just being so on edge because... I was like, I really want this to be easy. I want this to be a simple process. Okay, we have glass, steel. Now let's go and replicate these things. And I remember sitting at this co-working space that Xavier belonged to. And we sat down and he, he showed it to me. And my heart just completely sank. Just completely sank. Because I was like, this thing 
is hideous. I remember thinking it was ugly. Sure. But it was short and squatty. It was nothing like the renderings. It was nothing it, like the it, pictures. It, it, it was, but it... W- it was, but it wasn't. It didn't translate. It didn't translate because yeah. I, in my head, I'm seeing the finished version of the the indu- the, the pictures of the renders. Of course. And a, an issue that all industrial designers have with us normal people is that they'll go and make these incredible renders and then you'll, uh, you know... And then we'll go and see a prototype of it. And if it doesn't match the the, the render, we all feel disappointed. Mm-hmm. And so every time you talk to an industrial designer, they're like, don't focus. You know, the renders are renders. They're not going to be look like this in real life. Everyone making a product in the past has, has gone through this situation, I'm sure. Oh, like, yeah. They've been disappointed. It's, it's sure. hugely disappointing. And so I remember to ask and Xavier, I was like, hey, great job doing this. And he was, he was very confessed about it. He's like, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm an industrial designer. And so... He was very upfront about all that, and he goes, what this case needs in order to be great is it's going to need mechanical engineering. And I was like, oh, man, that just went... That took this project from what I thought was going to be a simple project to a very long, expensive, hard, but awesome project. And so we'll, we'll talk about that more later, but but it was cool. We took that um, that squatty, short, first prototype... And we took it to a few people, a handful of people. Including cash cards. Including cash cards and our friends over there. And we actually got incredible feedback from people. So mm-hmm. even though I was really kind of disappointed with it, the the essence of it being here's something that's heavy, that it's steel, that's glass, that comes together and protects the card. The people we showed it to were like, this is visionary. This Everyone is revolutionary. Everyone understood that the market need. Mm-hmm. They knew that this there was something there. It just had to be refined. And yeah. it wasn't friends and family, too. The, the, the cool thing about this industry is that card collectors are the most honest. Brutal. Brutally <laughs> honest people, which is so refreshing. Like, they're not going to lie to your face. They're going to be like, I don't like this. This is bad. This mm-hmm. is stupid. This mm-hmm. this is what you need to improve. So getting that reassurance, re, uh, reassur- uh, gosh, words, <laughs> reassurance. Yeah. At early stages. Yeah, it was very validating. Yeah. Those first handful of collectors and high-end collectors we showed it to was extremely validating. Mm-hmm. Especially our friend Johnny. When Johnny held it and saw it, and he was like, this is the future. That's true, Johnny. Who's now uh, the, the artist that we commissioned to be uh, in our packaging for uh, the mint uh, hobby cases that are going to be coming out soon. Yeah. And so that's the beginning of how we went and developed our very first prototype I didn't mean to get into such detail. No, no, no. Like, I, I, it's, I think it's, we, there's a lot let's there, totally right? save the, the mechanical engineering story and how we went from prototype to prototype to prototype to now our finished product. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's but, uh, talk about that next, next time for sure. Yeah. Sure. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. That's awesome. So you that was have... episode six. Stay tuned for episode seven. You're going to the playoff baseball game. Yeah. Time, right. Yeah. Actually, that's what I got to get ready for is I'm going to see the Padres and the Dodgers, they are tied one game each. The big game. Dodgers got destroyed big, big in the game. last one. What's it? Was it seven o'clock tonight? It's at six o'clock in six. San Diego, and I'm okay. really excited for it. On three, say the, the name of the team that's going to win. One, two, three. <laughs> Dodgers. Mets, 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 Mets. <laughs> Mets.